Hey everyone, it's William Moore and you're watching Beyond the Ties That Bind. I hope that everybody has had a wonderful day. Today I want to talk about the Constitution, one part of the Constitution in particular. It's actually not a part of the Constitution. It's the Second Amendment to the Bill of Rights. Now, as I've stated previously, the Bill of Rights was not a part of the original Constitution which was being drafted in 1787 in Philadelphia uh, during the coup d'etat which was taking place to overthrow the current system which was operating under the Articles of Confederation. The Bill of Rights was added later, about two years later. It's a writer to the Constitution and it was added as a compromise um, because of men like Patrick Henry, Richard Henry Lee, and George Mason and also Samuel Adams. So, um, when people talk about the Second Amendment, uh, which right now, if you go online, because of what's going on in the Commonwealth of Virginia with the uh, ban on what they call assault weapons, it's funny because I have never seen a weapon assault anyone by itself. Um, shouldn't it be called assault persons or assault people? Uh, using a weapon for the purpose of assaulting someone, but these are not assault weapons. Anyway, when um, you go online right now, Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, uh, certain blog posts, a lot of people are talking about the Constitution and the Second Amendment because of what's going on in the Commonwealth of Virginia, uh, where they have banned, uh, actually the House has passed a ban on certain weapons. So this takes us back to talking about the Second Amendment. And does the Second Amendment just carte blanche protect everyone's right to bear a weapon no matter what? what the design, function, or caliber of the weapon is. Does the Second Amendment, where it says shall not be infringed, mean that you can have and own any type of weapon and the state, the federal government, is going to protect that right no matter what? Does it mean that? I think we can see from history it does not mean that. So... We need to look at the wording of the Second Amendment. We also need to look at uh, the mind. Look into the mind of the man who uh, worded the Second Amendment to see what he thought about the amendment. Because if you want to find out the truth about a sentence or about a particular law, look no further than the mind of the man who created the sentence who formulated the sentence or created the law. So uh, now James Madison, he is erroneously called the father of the Constitution. He is not the father of the Constitution. George Clymer was probably the primary drafter of the Constitution in Philadelphia. Um, George uh, Clymer uh, wrote most of the articles, sections, and clauses. Now, when it comes to the Bill of Rights, which really is not part of the Constitution, um, Madison helped create, he helped formulate, draft some of the uh, wording of the amendments, uh, the Second Amendment in particular. So in order to find out what the Second Amendment really protects, we have to look into the mind of the man who created the amendment. Now, if we're all honest, we will all admit that one time or another, at one time or another, and probably many times in our life, we have to admit that we've been brainwashed, me included. Most of us were educated in government indoctrination centers known as public schools. Most of us have spent time in Christian indoctrination centers known as churches. And we're taught to believe things which never took place. And we're taught to believe that things which never took place um, actually are a part of our fabric. And then, on the other side of that, there's some things which did take place that we're taught to believe never took place. So, 
we've been brainwashed. There's just no doubt about it. Many of us hold on to biases. We've uh, developed biases throughout our life uh, because maybe of the culture we were brought up in, the traditions which were handed down from generation to generation to generation without anyone ever standing up to say, hey, wait, whoa, 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 let's research this to see if it's even true. So many of us have been lied to uh, concerning many different things throughout the course of our life. Santa Claus, anyone? Um, so we need to, as adults, when we are presented with new and challenging information, information which challenges everything that we hold dear, everything that we believe, if we are mature, we will research. We'll research both sides. We'll look into the matter. We will diligently pursue the truth. We will think critically. We won't just say, ah, that, nah, I don't believe that. I'll never believe that. That shows that a person is closed-minded and suffers from cognitive dissonance. So, when we're talking about this magical document known as the Constitution that people worship, um, we need to look into the mind of the people who actually were framing and creating the document. In this case, Mr. James Madison. However, before we get to the mind of James Madison, we're going to actually read the text of the Second Amendment. The text of the Second Amendment. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Okay, now let's read it slowly. And this is what the amendment's about. You can tell what the amendment's about just within the opening words. A well-regulated militia. Being necessary to the security of a free state, our government, our union, our nation, the right of the people to keep and bear arms, comma, shall not be infringed. However, what does that not be infringed mean? Does that mean, as I stated, that carte blanche, you can own anything that you want to own, that you can own a machine gun as far as the state's concerned? Now, I believe that you can. I believe that if you want to own a 50 caliber uh, machine gun that fires three rounds per second, and it would take a pretty stout dude to be able to handle that type of weaponry. Uh, but if you want to, if you want to own a 50 caliber machine gun, that's your business. It's no one else's business but yours, as long as you're not harming someone else with that weapon, as long as you're not being aggressive with that weapon. Um, so, when we look at the Second Amendment, does it just protect every right, no matter what the function, the caliber, the design of the weapon? The state is going to protect your right to own that weapon, no matter what? I think if we look at history, if we critically look at history, especially the last 50 years, we'll find out that the government is not going to be there for us to have our backs. And I'm speaking to weapons owners out there. Now, keep in mind, when James Madison drafted the Second Amendment, when he created the text of the Second Amendment, he had been at the coup d'etat in Philadelphia where they were overthrowing the current government which was operating under the Articles of Confederation and replacing it with the government which would operate under the United States Constitution. These psychopaths, these 55 psychopaths, well, actually 54, one left, but these 54 psychopaths, they got together and they were attorneys and bankers and land speculators. Attorneys, bankers, land speculators. Can anything good come about when 54 attorneys, bankers, and land speculators get together? I mean, come on. So, anyway, they get together. Madison's there. 
He's there as George Clymer is drafting the articles, sections, and clauses. Now, so if we keep in mind the wording of the Second Amendment, and then we go back to Article 1, Section 8, Clause 1, the Congress shall have power to lay and collect taxes, duties, impost, and excises, to pay the debts and provide for the common defense and general welfare of the United States. But all duties, imposts, and excises shall be uniform throughout the United States. Okay, I just wanted to get that out there because uh, it shows that Congress... Uh, basically has the oversight for the military and that they have unlimited power of taxation in that clause. Uh, that's what they wanted to grant themselves. That was the whole idea behind the Constitutional Convention. However, if we go down to Clause 15 in Section 8, it says, to provide for calling forth the militia to execute the laws of the Union, suppress insurrections, and repel invasions. So that's what the militia was for. To execute the laws of the Union, suppress insurrections, and repel invasions. Now, if we continue reading in Clause 16, we find to provide for organizing, arming, and disciplining the militia, and for governing such part of them as may be employed in the service of the United States, reserving to the states, respectively, the appointment of the officers and the authority of training the militia according to the discipline prescribed by Congress, that group of psychopaths. So, when we read that a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, we can go back to Section 8 and we can read in Clause 15, to provide for calling forth the militia to execute the laws of the Union, the Union being that free state, suppress insurrections and repel invasions. Now, Congress then provides for organizing, arming, and disciplining the militia. Disciplining the militia. Arming the militia. So, there is no document within American history more blindly worshipped than the United States Constitution. Um, the Constitution just confirms that history is always written by the victors. Um, Napoleon stated that history is just a set of lies that's agreed upon by the winning side and used by the winning side to set their agenda. So, um, the framers in Philadelphia, um, they wanted to strengthen the power of government because under the Articles of Confederation, they, hadn't, they had no power to tax and they had no power to pay the banks back. But Hamilton and Madison wanted to create a vehicle whereby they could pay the banks back. And we're talking central banks. Yes, back then there were central banks. 1913 did not was not the start of something new. So anyway, um, they conspired together. And during uh, the drafting of this document, they were thinking about a militia. Now, if we go to the mind of James Madison, uh, we're going to find out that this document called the Constitution, particularly the Second Amendment within the Bill of Rights, does not protect carte blanche your ability to own any weapon that you want to own. So quit using the Second Amendment to defend yourself, uh, to defend your 
right, and now rights come from government, rights come from whatever document that is uh, the governing document of the time. So you're saying that your right actually comes from the Constitution and that the government's going to protect that right. No. Um, you know, you have freedoms which were given to you by your creator. One of those freedoms is the right of self-defense. Look in the Torah, the first five books of scripture. You have the right of self-defense, the freedom to defend yourself. So, um, James Madison, he presents a bill for the preservation of deer. Uh, in 1785, Madison twice submitted a bill to the Virginia General Assembly entitled, A Bill for the Preservation of Deer. Uh, both times the House failed to act. Um, the law would actually penalize people who shall bear a gun out of his enclosed ground. Now, there were a lot of people uh, when you had that rally at the Virginia Capitol who were saying that they had the right, to, uh, according to the document known as the Constitution, uh, to actually carry weapons onto the grounds of the state capitol. That's not true. James Madison, when he wrote the Second Amendment uh, that people are saying protected their freedoms to carry a weapon on the capitol grounds, uh, when he wrote the Second Amendment, he was in no way protecting that type of freedom with weaponry. Um, the law penalized people who shall bear a gun out of his enclosed ground unless whilst performing military duty. So you could only have, as far as James Madison con was concerned, you could only have this weapon inside your enclosed ground. Not just carry it wherever you wanted to carry it. Not open carry, concealed carry. So we actually have a little bit more freedom being allowed or permission being given um, nowadays than what James Madison was thinking back then. In Madison's mind, there was a distinct difference between bearing a gun for personal use and bearing arms for defense. And the state had the right to regulate the personal use of weapons or guns. People quit using the Second Amendment to defend your freedom. The Second Amendment means absolutely nothing. It is useless. It is powerless. So then you go on and you have the Rittenhouse Affair. And I'm going to read through this as quickly as possible. But in 1778, during the American Revolution, a British ship called the Active carried American prisoners, including Gideon Olmsted. Olmsted organized the prisoners, and they took control of the ship and started to sail to an American port when they were overtaken by an American privateer. Both Gideon and the privateer both claimed the ship's contents as their own. A court case followed, and Pennsylvania's Court of Admiralty determined that Olmsted was not in full control of the active when it, the privateer, found the ship. Therefore, the court split the prize four ways. Olmsted appealed to the Continental Congress, who ruled in his favor. But Pennsylvania resisted and ignored Congress' ruling. Uh, ignored Congress's ruling. Uh, Pennsylvania took the portion of the money they thought belonged to Olmsted and ordered the state treasurer, David Rittenhouse, to hold it in bond. Rittenhouse died in 1796 before the case was resolved and the bond was inherited by his daughters. In 1803, a federal judge ordered Pennsylvania to give the money to Olmsted and the state refused. In 1809, the U.S. Supreme Court ordered the federal court in Pennsylvania to enforce the 1803 decision. Federal marshals were sent to collect the prize money from Rittenhouse's daughters and were twice met by armed members of the Pennsylvania State Militia who, presented, who prevented the enforcement of the Supreme Court's ruling. The governor of Pennsylvania appealed to President James Madison hoping that the author of the Virginia Resolutions 
would side with state power, as in individual states. Madison responded that he was bound by the Constitution to side with the Supreme Court. Meanwhile, the federal marshal somehow got around the militia and arrested one of the Rittenhouse daughters. Another court case emerged. A portion of the new court case explored the role of the armed state militia resisting the federal government. After all, Pennsylvania exercised veto power over the federal government via the gun. Pennsylvania defended herself, in part, arguing the constitutional right of armed resistance. The U.S. attorney, and therefore James Madison, responded that violence against the U.S. government was the same as rebellion and revolution. There was no constitutional right to armed resistance. The jury agreed with Madison and his U.S. attorney. This case shows that Madison's government did not believe in the right to arm resistance and therefore the Second Amendment was not about states being armed to fight off a tyrannical government. The Second Amendment was created so that the people would defend that tyrannical government. And if you just slow down and think about what you're reading when you read the Second Amendment and then you go back to how this man who created, who worded the Second Amendment thought, you'll see exactly what it means. A well-regulated militia, a controlled militia, being necessary for this government to do whatever it wants. The right of the people who are in those militias shall not uh, to bear arms shall not be infringed this is what patrick henry was arguing against this well regulated militia which could render individuals defenseless against the united states government Patrick Henry knew more about the Constitution, and he knew the men who were responsible for framing the Constitution better than anyone alive today, and that's why he argued against it. That's why he argued against adopting the Constitution in Virginia, um, argued vehemently against James Madison, and that's why Madison was forced to compromise with certain things such as the Bill of Rights. But the Bill of Rights, the way he worded it, it had nothing to do with protecting personal freedoms as far as the ownership of weaponry. Now, I'm all for owning any type of weapon that you want and using that weapon in any manner which does not cause harm to another individual. It's especially if you want to own a 50 caliber machine gun for the defense of your family and yourself, I believe that you have the freedom to do so. James Madison didn't. He believed that the Second Amendment concerned the militia, hence his use of the word militia, his use of the word words to protect the state. And that's what the Second Amendment's about. Quit using the Second Amendment to defend your freedom to own weaponry because it was not created to defend your freedom to own weaponry. The big bad government is not going to defend your freedoms to, to own weaponry. They don't want you owning weaponry. The federal government, they are the ones who hold the authority over the document known as the Constitution. They decide how the document is to be interpreted. When it says we the people, it doesn't mean every Tom, Dick, and Harry out there. It means the people who are a part of that federal government. So the federal government, they interpret the meaning of the Constitution, not you or I. And when it comes down to it, it comes down to judicial review. 
And then you have a minority of five as far as the country is concerned, but a majority of five in the court determining how a certain part of the Constitution is to be interpreted. And we've seen over and over again throughout the years, it just comes down to this small group of people's opinion on a matter. Quit using this document, this silly piece of paper to defend your freedom. If you rely on this document to defend your freedom, your freedom will be taken away. You rely upon your intestinal fortitude to defend your freedoms and your creator, not the government, not a silly little piece of paper. Because I'm telling you, you try standing behind that silly little piece of paper when those jack-booted thugs show up at your front door to take your weapons away and see how that silly little piece of paper, see how good that silly little piece of paper defends your freedom. It won't. Now, the ideal that people have that your freedom to bear weapons, your freedom to bear arms, shall not be infringed upon. I agree with that. But that ideal should not rest in a piece of paper whose governing authority is the United States federal government. Scrap the piece of paper because I'm telling you, if you depend upon the Constitution, if you think your rights come from government, and if you believe in the Constitution, your ass believes that your rights come from government. Don't try and argue because it's fallen on deaf ears here. If you think the Constitution is special, if you think it defends your rights, then you believe that government grants your rights. I don't buy that. My, my freedoms were given to me via the Creator. And it's my responsibility to defend those freedoms, not government, not a piece of paper written, uh, uh, you know, that was written on by James Madison some 240 years ago. James Madison, he was not one that was invested in protecting personal freedoms like Patrick Henry, Samuel Adams, George Mason, Richard Henry Lee. He was not invested in anything but his own economic interest. He didn't care about the individual. Patrick Henry, read his speech at the Virginia Ratifying Convention. Read that speech. He argued against James Madison. And he pointed out, and he knew James Madison, that the Constitution would restrain freedom. And it created a body of people, a minority who would rule despotically over the majority of the people. So anyway, you know, stop using paper to defend your freedom. That's not the spirit of freedom. And stop using a, especially a government authorized piece of paper to defend your freedom. You want to do, let freedom be what defends your freedom. So anyway, uh, this is William Moore for Beyond the Ties of Bind. I hope that you got something from this. I'm going to put some links in the description. And please like the video. Please subscribe to the channel. Hit the notification icon and share this video. Uh, please do so, so we can get the word out, so we can we can you know expose lies, and that we can we can shine the light of truth on lies, so that people will be well equipped to defend their freedom and know the truth from the lies that we've been told. So anyway, um, until next time, people. I hope that everyone has a, a great day, and this is William Moore signing out. Peace. Breaking the law, breaking the law, breaking the law, breaking the law.